authority can be intimidating. It can be nerve-wracking, for instance, when you get pulled over by the police because they have authority to find you, they can impound your vehicle, or arrest you. But in at least one instance, even such an authority as this had to ask for help. A Michigan State trooper pulled over a speeder pulled over a speeder uh, one cold evening in January, and after getting the driver's license from him, he went back to his vehicle to write out the ticket, which amounted to more than $100, a pretty hefty ticket. After he finished and was leaving his car to give the ticket to the driver, the trooper absentmindedly pushed the door lock down and shut the door. Suddenly he realized that he was on the side of the highway in sub-freezing weather and was locked out of his car. So the trooper did the only thing he could. He walked up to the driver and said, here's your ticket, this is your court date, you need to slow down. And could I please have a ride to the patrol station? There are signs that our culture has a problem with authority. A couple of weeks ago, vandals defaced several buildings in Brussels. Our local newspaper reported that the anarchy symbol of a capital A with a circle around it can be found at three of the locations. Anarchists rebel against the established order, the authorities in place to give stability and effective process to society. The so-called Arab Spring, which has revolutionized government in several countries, would be another example of citizens rising up against authority, in this case entrenched in sometimes brutal dictatorships. How does this suspicion and resistance to authority come about? The classic empires, Egyptian dynasties, Greek and Roman empires, gave way to the medieval feudal system. Now in there, everyone between serfs and the bottom and the nobility and the top knew where they ranked on the scale. Then came the Enlightenment. Descartes and successive philosophers questioned assumptions that would have inherently vested royalty with divine right to rule. French Revolution championed liberté, égalité, fraternité, and blue-blooded heads roll. The American Revolution seemed to succeed in establishing a classless democracy. Very good, but even the mighty American superpower depends upon certain ordering of authority that it requires to function. Lately, the Occupy movement has questioned the rights of that top 1% to possess and control so much that the protesters challenge property rights. Even in the home, this suspicion of authority and secret predisposition to rebelliousness has brought pain and dysfunction. In the excellent movie Courageous, in which we just saw our clip, four fathers recognized the need for them to assert their authority as dads and provide leadership for their family in a loving way, a way that strengthens rather than throttles their family. In today's passage from Mark's Gospel, we see Jesus asserting his authority in a way that liberates the helpless and challenges the opposing forces. His authority is rooted in something far more profound than just greeting or riches or tradition. And sorry, it was a crazy week, so I didn't make up notes here. You make up on your own for making notes this week. But just got some headaches here. As we begin Mark 2, we find Jesus in Capernaum, having come home, as verse 1 puts it, probably to the house of Peter and Andrew. Remember, it's kind of a packed home already. Peter, his wife, his mother-in-law, Andrew, his brother, now Jesus, the disciples. It's about to get a whole bunch more packed. There, when people hear he's back, he gets swamped. Verse 2, so many gathered, there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Now, that's... Press pause right there. People are crowding around, filling the house, spilling out into the street, jamming up the road, and Jesus preached the word to them. What's it mean to our author, Mark, that he preached the word? What were the people flocking around hoping to hear? Was it was their attitude, yeah, ho hum, here comes just another sermon? What's your attitude as you gather here today? Are you eagerly expectant that God's going to show you something new and exciting, something that will shape your life, challenge your prejudices, help you think more along the lines of His kingdom and eternal truth? Exactly what's in Mark's mind. Now, unlike the other synoptic gospel writers, Matthew and Luke, the synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of together, they sort of follow the same flow. 
Mark doesn't have long passages specifically of Jesus' teaching prominent in his account. There's no Sermon on the Mount, like Matthew has, or Beatitudes, or even a special section of extended teaching parables like Luke has. Mark's more interested in telling an action-packed account of the events of Jesus' life, his amazing miracles and his surprising crucifixion. We'll have to wait until chapter 8, halfway through, before we hit the kernel of Jesus' teaching. Uh, Chapter 8, verse 31, after Peter's confession of him as the Christ, Mark says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. So, from chapters 2 through 7, Mark builds this momentum, this wondering, what actually is Jesus preaching when he preaches the word? And on what basis is he preaching? What's backing what he says? Is it just, because I say so, as are parents at times, underlying their authority? While Jesus is busy letting these golden gems drop from his lips, whatever they are, he gets interrupted. The audacity of some people. Who would dare to interrupt such a famous rabbi in the middle of a sermon? But bits of plaster and mud and branches are falling from the ceiling just in front of Jesus. Uh, it probably wasn't neat and squared up timbers like this. It was a Palestinian hovel. Uh, he brought the roof down. You can imagine people already crowded in underneath. Remember, it was jam-packed before. Squeezing and scrambling to get it out of the way of the falling debris. Then, through the patch of blue sky visible between the rough beams in this modest Palestinian cottage, you can see a pallet being lowered rather jerkily. It's tied to four ropes. Holding on are four friends of a paralyzed man, lowering him to the floor right in front of Jesus. Verse 4. They could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd. They had a definite accessibility problem. But did they let that stop them? They must have really cared about their friend. Perhaps he was in a desperate state. Perhaps his condition was terminal. And getting to this fantastic miracle worker was his last chance. The paralytic's friends showed desperate faith. They weren't dissuaded by the crowd. They were creative. They fought outside the box, or at least outside the house. I admire these guys. Their motto was, when God shuts one door, he opens a hole in the roof. So they climbed up the outside stairs. Kind of a tricky job when you've got a sick person on a stretcher. They poked and shoved and scrabbled and clawed their way through the hard, rolled and dried mud, down through the lath or the branches, until they could see a way to get their knee before the master's feet. Then they carefully lowered their friend. Again, take some coordination. Don't want to tip them off. They carefully lowered him down to the floor by Jesus. This man was literally at the end of his rope. Actually, all five of them were. What about you? When you have a need, are you desperate to take it to Jesus, as these men were? Are you easily dissuaded when it seems your prayers hit the ceiling? Keep praying, keep tearing away at the roof. Such desperate faith attracts God's notice. Verse 5. Jesus saw their faith. They're in for a surprise. Verse 5 continues. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. What? How is that relevant? I can just imagine the poor friends saying to themselves, But that's not what we brought him here for. Can't you see? He's physically sick, paralyzed. If we wanted forgiveness, we would have taken him to the temple, or at least the priest. Be patient, lads. Jesus has a reason for his approach. On the one hand, it could be that moral matters were at the root of the man's deteriorating condition. Robinson comments, The sins had probably caused the paralysis. Now, interesting how views have fluctuated on this over the centuries. In Jesus' time, Jewish people often suspected people's physical ailments were linked to actual sin. See John 9, where when the disciples are passing a man who's blind from birth, they just automatically ask, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? 
then, in modernity, the last couple of centuries, science has made such progress in describing natural factors contributing to sickness, viruses, bacteria, we couldn't see that before. The doctors poo-pooed moral factors as possible causes. Now, with postmodernism, psychology, and scientists' understanding of the complex relationships between hormones, the immune system, and total wellness, personal factors like stress and bitterness and jealousy and guilt are again being taken seriously as root factors that just can't be medicated away. Could the man's paralysis be related to sin? I saw a young man in the hospital recently whose left arm was immovable, paralyzed, due to a snowmobile accident that shattered his helmet against a tree and left him unconscious throughout the night, extremities dangerously exposed to frostbite. Is there a, a slight, teeny, weensy, weensy chance that sin could have been a contributing factor? Or take Johnny Erickson Tata, a famous Christian singer, artist, and author whose diving accident left her a paraplegic when she jumped in and struck a rock. Could there not be an element of human responsibility at stake there? Was the man on the pallet bound up in a cycle of blaming himself for his condition? On the other hand, Jesus likely had a wider audience in view. He saw a way to use this healing as a teachable moment. He wanted to show people he was much more than just another miracle worker. After all, Pharaoh's magicians have been able to duplicate some of the wondrous miracles and signs that Moses performed at this time of the Exodus. Jesus wanted to draw back the curtain a bit more on his real identity, who he was. And he's chosen the right audience. Verses 6 and 7. Now, some teachers of the law, or some translation, scribes, were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus' words, literally sending away the man's sins, were shocking to these religious professionals. You see, as the NIV study Bible notes, in Jewish theology, even the Messiah could not forgive sins. For Jesus to have the audacity to talk as if he himself had the authority or right or power to forgive sins was to claim a power, we thought, only God had. Gloves were off. Jesus' simple words rattled the tower of the religious assumptions with the force of a hurricane. In their books, this classes as outright blasphemy. What the lexicon describes as impious and reproachful speech injurious to the divine majesty. You're giving God a slap in the face. Isn't it? To these religious pros, Jesus' statement was an affront to holy God, worthy of death. In fact, we go to the other end of Mark's account, 1464, and this blasphemy is the charge that pinches the case in the Sanhedrin's mind as to whether Jesus deserves the death penalty. So, Jesus is playing with high stakes here. Except the ace up his sleeve is that, in his case, it's not blasphemy. It's the truth, because he really is God. And he can prove it. Verse 8. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. He said to them, why are you thinking these things? His next words go on to show he knew exactly what they were thinking. Now, don't overlook this miraculous capacity of Jesus. Yes, in a minute he's going to perform a physical healing, but in some ways this miracle of knowing people's thoughts is even more impressive. Who is this guy? Mind reading? Yes. See, Jesus' insight into Nathaniel before he even met him, John 1. And the disciple John's comment in John 2, 24, Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Peter boasting about following Jesus more than the others, and Jesus predicting Peter's denial would be another example. Healing a paralytic is wonderful. Being able to read people's thoughts, that's absolutely eerie. There's more than one miracle in this passage. Don't skip over it too quickly. <coughs> Verse 9, Jesus continues, Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? Well, one's about as easy as the other to say. You could have said either. 
but both are equally impossible for any mere human to do. So Jesus sets the stage to demonstrate that he is no ordinary human, quite a different bird altogether from the religious vigilantes thinking dark thoughts in his direction. He's about to show that he can do both. Verse 10. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This is Jesus' whole point. That they may know, that they may come to understand who he really is, his awesome power, his authority, or right, or ability to forgive sins. But this implication is far greater than just an ability to heal. Miracles are not an end in themselves. They're pointers to the larger truth of God's omnipotence encapsulated in Jesus. The core of our religious journey, our spiritual pilgrimage, is this issue of coming to grips with Christ's authority. Am I willing to let God be God? Do I grasp how awesome and fearsome to be revered as the creator of the universe and worthy of my love? Will I bow before Jesus' the Son, whom the Father sent to be the Savior of the world? Can't I trust Him enough to submit to His Lordship, whatever befalls me? Can I say with Job in the Old Testament, Though He slay me, yet will I hope in Him? Can I release all that bitterness and complaining and resentment from not getting everything I ever wanted in life? In spite of all that's ever disappointed me, can I acknowledge God has a right to do with me as he pleases? Can I trust him to work it all out for good? Can I let him author and complete my life and faith, be my ultimate authority? Robinson comments, knowing full well that he had exercised the prerogative of God in forgiving the man's sins, he proceeds to justify his claim by healing them. The proof is in the pudding. Having set up his teaching point, Jesus brings the lesson home. Verses 10 to 12. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. And not the close parallel between word and work right there in verses 11 and 12. Get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out, full view of them all. Jesus speaks, it happens. Perhaps an echo of the Lord, Yahweh, God of being, who merely spoke the universe into existence. This wonderful sign leaves people amazed. So Jesus proves undebatably to his critics that, as he puts it, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. By the way, I like the subtle way he's referring to himself in the third person, the Son of Man, is both humble and dodges the charge of having made a direct first person claim to deity. He's not saying, I have authority on earth to forgive sins, which they could latch on to right away. He says, the Son of Man, who's that? It's a claim to be the Messiah in terms that could not be easily attacked. The good news is that supreme authority rests in one who calls himself the Son of Man. Such a humble way for the unique incarnate God-man to refer to himself. His power is harnessed to benefit you. Though he had the power to heal and restore the paralyzed to full functionality, your Redeemer submitted his greatness to your most desperate need, the forgiveness of your sins. So he went to the cross to pay your penalty. He doesn't abuse his authority. He uses it to strengthen you, to bless you. The captain on the bridge of a large naval vessel saw a light ahead on a collision course. He signaled, alter your course ten degrees south. The reply came back, alter your course 10 degrees north. The captain then signaled, alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a captain. The reply, alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a seaman, third class. The furious captain signaled, alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a battleship. The reply, alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a lighthouse. Are we prepared to adjust our course to a higher authority? Let's pray.